Okay, we're now at five minutes past the hour, so let's get started. So good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us to talk about the future of green aluminum. My name is Julia Atwood, and I lead the advanced materials team at Bloomberg NEF. Bloomberg NEF provides data and research on the technologies, policies, and strategies bringing about a transition to a cleaner economy. And we do that across energy, transport, and industry. But the reason why I'm here today moderating this panel is because of our work on decarbonizing metals and the circular economy. So before we start the panel discussion, I wanted to do a short bit of level setting for anyone who's maybe not as familiar with the aluminum industry as our panelists are. So if we go ahead and go to the next slide, what's really driving this change to decarbonize materials and in industry is net zero. Globally, the ambitions for net zero emissions by 2050 are growing. Now, all the countries that you can see in color on this map are discussing, proposing, or have already passed legislation for a net zero target. Now, most of us are aware of the current paths for electricity and transport to decarbonize through wind, solar, hydro, and electric vehicles. But there are also the hard to abate industries to consider, including materials production. So what does that mean for these countries' domestic manufacturing? If we look at the next slide, this is the breakdown for carbon emissions from industrial heat by sector. Now, of course, this is going to vary from country to country, but broadly, the largest portion of emissions come from iron and steel, cement, and chemicals. And this is what all of these countries have to look at incentivizing change. Now, aluminum is also there at 7% of industrial emissions, but it's a much smaller component than its counterparts. And if we go on to the next slide, you can see that that's because most of the heat, most of the process energy for aluminum production comes from electricity. And the source of that can be clean, like the hydropower that's used in Quebec, where 90% of Canada's aluminum is made, or it can be coal or gas, as is often used in China. So the source of that electricity is incredibly important and really determines the carbon footprint, the sustainability, the greenness of the aluminum that you're getting. Now on the next slide, we can see the options for cleaner, greener aluminum. Now the first is to make primary aluminum with low carbon electricity, like balanced renewables or hydropower. The second option is to incorporate more recycled material. And the last is to consider using clean fuels like hydrogen. Now Bloomberg NEF is covering all of these, but because this last option is still an emerging technology, today we're going to focus on the first two. So with that, I think we can end the slide share and it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists. I'm going to give a short bio for each of them and then ask them to explain a little bit about their work and what they're going to be discussing here. So first I'll go to Jean Simard who is the president and CEO of the Aluminum Association of Canada. Jean holds a degree in civil law from the University of Ottawa and has extensive experience in public and government affairs. Prior to joining the Aluminum Association of Canada, Jean was the vice president of sustainable development, public and government affairs at Gaz Metro, which is an energy company based in Quebec. He's a co-founder and member of the steering committee for SWITCH, the Alliance for a Greener Economy, and a member of the Advisory Council of the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. So Jean, I'll pass to you to introduce the work that you do. Oh, Jean, I believe you're still on mute there. So you just need to unmute. Sorry about this. <clears throat> thanks. Good morning, everyone. And thanks to Climate Week for having us over. Uh, I head the Aluminium Association of Canada, which gives me the privilege of uh, representing uh, three world-class uh, primary aluminium producers, namely Alcoa, Rio Tinto, and uh, Alouette. Uh, <clears throat> those uh, smelters are located uh, across Canada, uh, most of them in Quebec, with an additional one in British Columbia. Uh, <clears throat> 
Canadian primary aluminium uh, entered into a decarbonization pathway uh, years ago, uh, <clears throat> back in the 1990s, with the beginning of a remodernization of the capacity and also <clears throat> improvement of uh, operations to the extent that we <clears throat> are now today uh, at the lowest uh, threshold of CO2 emissions in terms of aluminium, primary aluminium production. As we move <clears throat> from 2020 to 2030, uh, we are now reaping the, the benefits of this uh, legacy uh, as the market is trying to, starting to recognize or materialize uh, <clears throat> the potential value of low carbon footprint uh, material, uh, such as aluminum in this case, uh, with, as an example, very recently announced a low carbon aluminum financing platform by uh, Traffic Euro Traders and the Rabo Bank. Uh, <clears throat> and also, as governments are moving towards procurement policies aimed at uh, <clears throat> giving uh, value, recognizing the value of low CO2 uh, materials, and also entertaining the possibility of border uh, adjustments as CO2 is moving through material back and forth. Uh, in a national jurisdiction. Uh, the years ahead, we'll see uh, the, the uh, development and deployment of uh, <clears throat> low, no carbon uh, footprint uh, technology such as ELISIS and my colleague Paramita from Rio Tinto will certainly uh, be happy to uh, uh, talk more about uh, this uh, game-changing technology. And finally, we will keep pushing on those initiatives as an industry and government in Canada uh, to reach uh, the 2050 uh, targets. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. We also have with us Paramita Daz, who's the General Manager for Global Marketing and Development at Rio Tinto. Paramita has extensive experience in the commodities segment across metals and oil and gas. Prior to moving to Chicago to lead the marketing and development space, Paramita was Chief of Staff to the CEO of Rio Tinto and Chief Transformation Officer for the Atlantic Operations for the Aluminum segment within Rio Tinto. He's also active in diversity, sustainability, and gender equality issues. He's worked with forums like UN Women and platforms such as Ascend. So Paramita, I'll hand it to you to tell us a bit more about Rio Tinto. Thanks, Julia. It's uh, absolutely a pleasure to be here with the group um, and very happy to join my fellow panelists for this very critical topic. Let me start with Rio Tinto. Rio is a 147-year-old diversified metal and mining company with operations in six continents. In North America, we have operations in Canada and US. Our North American aluminum assets are all in Canada and very proud to say, sit on the lowest end of carbon footprint already in the industry. In Canada, we make our aluminum from water. And that's how we like to speak about it. Our metal comes from water. Across our global operations, our global aluminum operations, our carbon footprint is already 60% below industry average. Our technology advanced smelters in Canada operate in the first decile of the industry cost curve and run on 100% clean hydro so hydro-powered energy. And then there are many industry firsts from us, which we are very humbly proud of. We launched the first certified low carbon aluminum renewal back in 2016. Uh, today, customers seek out renewal for their products and for green financing with their banks, which Jean alluded to just before me. Then Aluminium Stewardship Initiative. Rio was the first company to be certified and first company to sell ASI certified metal back in 2018, 2019. And then lastly, Elysis. I cannot end any presentation without the mention of Elysis. This is probably the most significant breakthrough for the aluminum industry in a century. In partnership with Alcoa and supported by Apple and the governments of Canada and Quebec, 
carbon-free aluminum smelting technology instead of CO2 back into the atmosphere. That's what Ellipsis is. And lastly, we recently announced our first ever closed loop recycling solution for our customers. We hope to provide a supply chain, a full spectrum of solutions from end to end. We at Rio have the green aluminum future at the heart of our strategy and have a role to play in all facets of a true circular economy, wherever this metal goes. So looking forward to this discussion, uh, Julia, back to you. Thank you so much, Paramita. We also have JP Sater, who's the Director for Business Development and Operations at Canner. JP has experience across manufacturing and the finance industries. He was previously a Vice President at TorQuest Partners and also worked in M&A at RBC Capital. He holds an MBA from the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto and engineering and economics degrees from Queen's University. So JP, I'll pass to you to speak more about Canard. Thanks, Julia. And thank you, uh, mostly Paramita, for the invitation uh, to join today's panel. Uh, Canard is a manufacturer of aluminum extrusions. We are one of the top 10 largest companies in that regard in North America. Um, our process is we take logs from Rio Tinto and convert them into shapes, uh, such as bumpers or window and door frames and other consumer and industrial products. Uh, our customers are across Canada, the US and into Mexico. And we're generally one to two steps away from the final destination of the aluminum product that we convert. Uh, I'm excited to share a bit of a smaller company perspective uh, on this topic and how we see uh, purchasing decisions driven uh, and the motivations more downstream, uh, closer to the consumer, and certainly um, you know, our individual part to uh, being an efficient manufacturer with uh, very low waste and a consciousness to recycling wherever we can. So uh, I think Canard's perspective will, will be a bit more to some of the elements you mentioned, Julia, towards recycling and uh, the downstream consumer. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, JP. And finally, we also have Nick Madden, who is a senior vice president at Novellis. So prior to this role, Nick was the senior vice president for manufacturing excellence and the chief procurement officer for Novellis. He has 42 years of experience in the aluminum industry in the UK, Canada, Switzerland, and the US. He's a board member of the Aluminum Stewardship Initiative and was until recently a member of the Aluminum Committee and Physical Market Committee of the London Metal Exchange. So Nick, I'll pass to you to tell us a bit more about Novellas. Thank you, Julia, and good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, for the last 14 years, I've led global procurement at Novellis until earlier this year. Novellis is the world's largest producer of around 4 million tons of flat rolled aluminum products. Um, we're also the leading recycler of aluminum in the world. Uh, last year, for instance, as an example, we recycled 74 billion drinks cans in, in Europe, Asia, South America, and the US. Um, we're the global market leader in beverage can and automotive. And we're also supplying into the aerospace, electronics, commercial transportation, architectural, and other specialty markets. So we have a kind of, as um, JP mentioned, we have a perspective on what the customers are looking for across a broad spectrum of markets. And as the top recycler, uh, we're very focused on a buoyant circular economy and kind of proud that the average recycled content of Novellis products is around 60%. Uh, our purpose as a company is to shape a sustainable world together. And for that reason, I'm very excited to be able to join the panel. And I'd like to thank you for the invitation, Parameter. Thank you so much, Nick. Okay, before we begin the discussion, I just want to remind you of my housekeeping point from earlier for the audience. So if you have any questions for the panelists while we're talking, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add your question there. I'll be doing my best to incorporate them into the discussion where they're relevant. 
And if I can just anticipate the first question, yes, we will be recording the webinar and it will be made available through Climate Week channels. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into the discussion. So I really want to kick off with how each of you see the role of the aluminum industry in net zero targets. You've each touched on what your different companies are doing in order to contribute to that. But I'd like to kind of take people to 30,000 feet and give them the overall view. So maybe if I can go to Jean first, just to talk about how aluminum and greener aluminum fits into those Canadian targets that you mentioned, Jean. Yeah. Okay, am I on now? Yes, you are. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> you have to look at the whole life cycle uh, of the primary metal. Uh, so from its uh, production all the way through its uh, user's life. And uh, uh, Canada uh, has the lowest carbon footprint in terms of producing uh, aluminium, uh, is working still at reducing uh, uh, some of the emissions aside from the process emissions which are in the technological threshold. So it's, a, it's like an 80-20 type of, of situation where we've done 80% of what could be done. The last 20% requires 80% of the effort. So it's going to be, it's incremental and it's very small. And <clears throat> the, the other part of it in the life cycle is the user phase. And more and more, we think that there should be optimization in the choice of materials for infrastructure, buildings, and other kinds of applications where aluminium is the better material, depending of the user of uh, the usage that you want that you intend to do with it. And this will enable also an additional contribution to reducing. CO2 emissions because it could last longer than other and other kind of material through uh, its whole life cycle and you can recycle it afterwards which is not necessarily the case with other materials so you have to look at it as a as a total uh, life cycle approach from uh, the production all the way to the disposal at the other end and this is how we can best contribute uh, to <clears throat> uh, lessening uh, the carbon emissions in our country. Thank you, John. That was a great overview. Now, Paramita, you mentioned the broad spectrum of things that we have from analysis to recycling um, to making metal from water, which is a quote that I love. Um, are you seeing this mostly? being governed by what your customers are asking for? Is it more on sustainability targets or is it an anticipation of government policy in these net zero targets? Sure, Julian. It's a brilliant question. I'll refer back to your slide that uh, you had. Uh, you showed the implication of aluminium uh, on the carbon footprint. Uh, let me start with that, but then it's through, then mentioned that throughout the supply chain, around 80% of those emissions occur at a smelting phase. And uh, this comes out from alumina converted into aluminium, and then of course going through the supply chain, but a majority of that emissions is actually sitting with an, a typical aluminium smelter. Now, we are very well positioned, thanks to, as I said, we make metal from water, but we are very well positioned with our hydropowered electricity source from which we make aluminium, especially in Canada. Um, but then uh, you bring it down to how it flows through the supply chain. And that's why we say we as primary producers, even though we deal with the virgin metal, we can't look the other way. We are putting a full spectrum of uh, solutions for our customers, including recycling. And I mind you, this is a new adventure for us. Uh, and we are taking small steps, but we do have a role to play if we are serious about circular economy. Now, when you mentioned how it goes through the supply chain, Julia, uh, we of course look for cues from our customers like uh, Novellas, like Canard, to say, okay, what really matters for their operations? 
but then we also follow through them or through direct interactions with the end users are getting signals that the consumers on the street, people very similar to you and I are also asking for the carbon footprint that they are leaving from the packaging and the materials that they use. Our metal ends up in cars, cans, construction, and we want to hear from the consumers, we want to hear from the end users, we want to hear from our customers in the supply chain to ensure that we have the right solutions. And um, as I say, the net zero future is on its way and that future is coming at us fast. And green aluminium has a significant role to play as even a potential material of choice for that low carbon future that you and I are asking for as simple consumers. I don't know if that answered your question. Happy to elaborate more, yeah? No, oh, that definitely answered it. And you've given me the perfect segue into bringing in JP and Nick here. Um, so I think Paramita and I and everyone else in this call is probably in a special subset of people who really pay attention to those net zero policies. I'd imagine it's quite dry for the average consumer. Um, but JP and Nick, you guys are much closer to the person on the street that Paramita was mentioning. So I'd love to know whether the lofty ambitions of these countries bringing in net zero targets, do they match up with what your customers are asking for? Are they you know, actively interrogating you about the sustainability of your products? Do they really want to know where their metal is coming from? Um, maybe I'll start with JP to give the Canadian perspective and then Nick, you can talk to us in a global sense. Yeah, thanks. Um, we certainly see uh, like I said in our intro, uh, primary markets that Canard's products service are transportation, building and construction, and then other consumer and industrial products. Um, the automotive sector definitely is leading the charge on demanding and requesting sustainability and traceability options. Um, certain OEMs who are very public about their long-term goals on low carbon and CO2 total emissions. Um, come to CanArt with uh, ideas on how they can achieve those goals and are often uh, rather delighted that we, through extrusion operations, um, can offer products that they weren't aware of in terms of meeting their, their total sustainability targets, as well as the quality, top-notch quality product that they expect in an efficient supply chain. So we're seeing a very strong drive in the automotive sector and that extends um, you know, into other types of transportation as well. We're seeing more other types of vehicles, be it electric vehicles on the consumer side or on the fleet side who are trying to move towards this greener direction. In building and construction, uh, obviously a very large construction market in North America, um, windows and doors are often made from aluminum. Companies tend to request lead certifications for the end building owner and aluminum plays a strong part in that. And so for 10 plus years, um, LEEDs certifications have been a strong part of the product demand that we see. Um, and that's an offering that we, we provide. When it comes to, I'll call it the more uh, general metal for consumer and industrial purposes, be it office furniture or um, industrial um, manufacturing, the demand is certainly less. We don't have a lot of people that ask for green aluminum. Um, there are spots of questions to traceability. Where is the aluminum sourced from? Um, then there are correlated questions about um, you know, the, the quality of that aluminum, but it's not yet focused on green. So we're seeing spots of requests for traceability increases, um, but really, at that segment of the market, it's still price first quality and delivery as long as I can still have it yesterday. Um, so uh, that's a segment of the market that um, is very large and will have to take different steps to, to start pushing the green. And one last thing I'll mention is, um, you know, CanArt does uh, try to have its customers choose aluminum versus say substitute products like steel we also try to convince our customers and downstream to buy North American aluminum um, rather than buy uh, derivative products from other places of the world. So our substitute threats and opportunities um, are, are a little bit different than, than the ones Paramita's um, company faces and, and maybe similar to Nick's. 
That's great. So Nick, is this pretty similar to what you're seeing in globally? Yeah, I mean, I would say all that, and <laughs> that's an excellent answer from JP. It's, it's kind of interesting when you look at the global picture because there are kind of, there is, there are, it's like a patchwork. So I, I, from my perspective, I'd say as, as a region, Europe is, is far ahead in terms of uh, carbon emissions legislation, taxation, and as you showed from your, from your chart, and in the US, we had the, uh, the fuel efficiency regulations, which had been rolled back by the, the current administration. But globally, that is a trend. And so in China, in Europe, the pressure on fuel emissions continues. And I think it's interesting, just to give a couple of illustrations. So um, the, uh, because of the light weighting of vehicles, fuel efficiency improvements and electrification, the amount of emissions from the tailpipe of a vehicle by 2025 will be 80% lower than in 2017. In fact, by 2025, the, the carbon emissions generated in the materials that go into the vehicle will be greater than the tailpipe emissions in the life of the vehicle. And I think that gives you the context for this kind of real interest among the OEMs, the auto manufacturers, and so examples are Nissan, 80% uh, reduction in carbon by 2050, uh, um, BMW and VW, Audi Group and Ford reductions. Uh, Mercedes Daimler is, is, is uh, targeting B0 carbon by 2039. And of course, when they do that, the first people they turn to are their suppliers to say, okay, has exactly as JP said, so you need to help us get there. But by the way, that means you need to be there too, at least with your product. And so I would uh, just, as a, just as a slight uh, digression, just mention, and so when we start talking about the carbon footprint or the light carbon in the life cycle of aluminum in, in, in vehicles and so on, it's not just about the primary source and the, fuel and the uh, energy that was um, used in the generation of primary aluminum. But the biggest lever of reducing carbon is actually recycling. And so if you compare recycled aluminum, the carbon footprint of that with the carbon footprint of even the, 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 the most lowest carbon primary, it's 90% lower. And there's a nice, so it's 0 0.6, 0 0.7 kilos per kilo of aluminum, kilos of CO2 equivalent compared with, um, I think four, four, I think we say seven tons if, if I look at the full end to end of uh, the primary system for a lot of the major primaries. So we believe that's where the focus should be. So again, back to legislation. So we see it evolving around carbon. I think where we, we would believe we would like to see more is around, for instance, uh, deposit legislation in the US where, because on beverage cans, so 75% so of all the aluminum ever produced is still in circulation. Our concern is what about the other 25%? And I think the, the gaps that we see are in, 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 um, in things like packaging recycling. So I think there's areas where we could see an improvement through government help in, uh, in recycling, which ultimately will reduce the carbon footprint of the industry in addition to the work that's being done on the primary side. Thank you. Yeah, that's a critically important point. And I definitely want to come back to recycling because I think that is, you know, we could do a loaner on that just all on its own. Mm -hmm. But we actually had a question come through about how global companies um, like Walmart are increasingly turning to their supply chain, which includes all of you, um, and saying that they want to specifically buy from people, from companies uh, that are as sustainable as as they can be. So the question is, how are, are your companies adapting to that? I guess both when you're looking at your own suppliers, is there work for you to do there on finding their sustainability? And, and how are you as suppliers to many of these huge companies um, adapting to that? I think it's been touched on a little bit from all of your comments, but Paramita, maybe if you could speak to it directly. Yeah. Julia, uh, you're absolutely right. We are hearing that retailers are also asking for that, um, that transparency around the supply chain. And 
Nick alluded to it, that when companies react to those kind of responses, they turn to the supply chain and the suppliers and say, so what are you doing about it? And we have to work as an ecosystem. Where we sit, we are at the very start of the supply chain. For us, there are very few suppliers, but we are the largest supplier from where probably that origin starts. And it has to be a whole some holistic view. Uh, we look at our own uh, performance as a company across globally, and uh, Rio has recently put out its sustainability targets uh, with a net zero uh, target for 2050 and the 2030 targets of real numerical uh, reductions, uh, which I can get into in details. We, since 2008, actually, we've been on this journey. We have put our uh, our targets and then our performance out. Uh, we are um, upping the ante a little bit to say we are going to be, go even more uh, by 2030. And um, you know, earlier I mentioned Alysis. That's actually one of the examples I will cite. If Alysis is launched at scale, we will manage to reduce another 6 million tons of carbon by 2050, around 2050 itself across our operations. So, those are really big step change and big game changers. Um, but then we, you know, JP alluded to the transparency and the traceability side. We firmly believe that uh, it's no longer going to be enough for companies to sit back and say, trust us, we are doing the right thing and we are meeting the targets. We'll have to show. So consumers and customers are going to trust but verify and the verification process is going to be very critical. Uh, we at Rio are uh, actively working with supply chain to bring more and more traceable and um, transparent metrics to the supply chain such that they can then permeate it to uh, their customers to, for the use of the likes of Walmart or even the OEMs, the automakers who have to deal with USMCA and uh, rules of origin simultaneously. So for us, sustainability is about what we do as a company at the very start of the supply chain through our metrics. And we have targets around carbon, we have targets around total uh, emissions, and then we are trying to bring those stories to the supply chain through a traceable, transparent manner and using digital as a platform. Because one thing that we have learned through this COVID era is digital is actually an enabler and a toolkit that is going to get used more frequently and it's also a, a keen toolkit for us to get our messages across uh, to the consumers and to the end users uh, in, this, uh, in this time frame really quickly. There are great stories about aluminium, including primary, including recycling. To Nick's point, you know, recycling has a big play in a low carbon green future. I'll just add to that that it also starts from, you know, what what are you recycling from? And that's where we come in as a primary producer. Um, Hydro-powered sourced aluminium hopefully will get even a better result for the recycled product than any other uh, sourced aluminium like gas or uh, coal. So we hope to supplement, complement, and hopefully uh, add to the storyline that Nick and uh, JP are taking to their consumers. That's great. It's fantastic to have almost the whole supply chain here on the one call. I know that's going to be a really um, great advantage to everyone listening in. Um, so I want to actually bring up Canadian aluminum here because it is some of the cleanest in the world. And maybe if I can just ask Jean, can you talk a little bit about how uh, maybe the Quebec government has been working with the aluminum industry? And also, is this the heyday now for Canadian aluminum? Are all those people who are looking for more sustainable metals suddenly turning to Canada? Jean, I think you're on mute if you're speaking to us. Okay. Uh, yep, you're back. I'm back? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, Quebec government, and I, I should add also the Canadian government, uh, have been uh, very supportive of uh, the uh, repositioning of Canada's aluminum uh, industry. Um, the uh, Quebec government, about uh, eight years ago, 
uh, <clears throat> accepted to uh, co-fund with the primary industry uh, a new an aluminium cluster, which brings together the whole ecosystem uh, in Quebec, from world-class research centers all the way down to uh, OEMs, integrators, uh, primary uh, producers, and uh, processors of metal, in order to uh, further develop. Uh, the use and increase the use of aluminium in our economy and also uh, <clears throat> uh, contribute to materializing in the future the full value of our low carbon footprint uh, metal. A case in point is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the uh, traceability uh, platform that we are now deploying through all the plants uh, in Canada by the end of this year which will be a, a fabulous uh, digitalized enabling platform for uh, the automotive value chain in order to document its use of quote unquote smelted and poured within Canada primary metal and <clears throat> going through all the uh, steps of, of reprocessing or transformation of this metal all the way to uh, the OEM. So um, we're really, Canada, is in, Canada and Quebec are investing in the future of this industry and they know that it's a long haul, but uh, we have a very strong footing to start from. That's great. So it sounds like having all of the aluminum or most of it concentrated there in Quebec is useful um, in order to help suppliers be able to see the whole value chain. And then as well, all of the tracking and traceability really gives them and the confidence. So well, that was a great answer. Um, tracking and traceability has been brought up a couple of times by you all, so I sense it's something that we should talk about. Uh, Paramita mentioned it, Jean mentioned it, it was something the whole industry is working on. I'm really curious to get Nick's view on this because Nick, your company is dealing with a primary source, a secondary source, and all of those pretty demanding clients who want to see a lot of sustainability. So can you speak to some of the challenges of that tracking and traceability and are things getting better? I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no doubt the comments John made are absolutely true. Canada's very well positioned as, as this whole uh, primary discussion evolves, but there is a limit to the amount of capacity in the world that's available with that kind of benign hydro base. And unfortunately, a lot of other production is coming from a coal base because the demand for aluminium is so enormous and the growth is enormous. Uh, so when we look globally, one of the concerns that we have is, the la is, is the, there's been a kind of um, uh, an explosion of, of uh, brands in the primary system where people are claiming, well, here, here's, here's my primary brand and this is the lowest carbon in the world, but this is my primary brand. Um, and I think it highlights to me that the, the industry, and this is more talking about the industry, how we should look ahead to improve things. I think we, we struggle, have struggled to come together as a global industry, unlike the steel industry, and develop common standards. But we have, for the last uh, 10 years, and certainly the last five, the Aluminium Stewardship Initiative, which I'm quite involved with, and I know the folks on the call are involved with as well, is attempting to set those standards. And those are standards around uh, chain of custody and performance, and then assuring and certifying. Uh, and what's interesting is the, the um, I think that is gradually taking off, starting in Europe. It's beginning to be, I think we're being pulled now in South America. I think some of the automotive companies in the US will start to pull along, along with the beverage, can, beverage companies. So I think for us, we need to see uh, more proliferation of a common standard in terms of how we define uh, low carbon primary, how we treat recycling in the, in, in the evaluation of the life cycle of aluminum. So when we're talking to our customers as an industry, as are the our competing materials like the steel companies in automotive or, or PET supplies in the beverage industry, we need to have a common voice, an honest, transparent projection of the aluminium life cycle. And I think we're on a path there, but, um, but I would like to see us do a little bit better uh, in terms of 
joining up and being organized globally, even though the aluminum associations at a re regional level do a very good job. That's a great point. And I think this idea of standardization and making sure that everyone is, is working towards the same thing would definitely be facilitated by some of the digital solutions that Parameter was mentioning. I think that combination of having a shared market and platform digitally, as well as making sure everyone is getting together to discuss standards is so a great. May I add just mm. one thing to that? Uh, Nick hit upon the Lumen Stewardship Initiative. That's, it took the industry such a long time to come to that parameter and to, now we owe it to all ourselves to stand behind it and push that uh, standard common denominator to the industry because, you know, it, he's absolutely right. There has been a proliferation. There has also been a proliferation of everybody coming out to provide an assurance model. So ASI is a holistic view covers carbon, but it also covers other metrics like biodiversity, water management, waste, and so on. And those metrics, though we are not talking on this forum, are probably also very important for us to address going forward, because what we don't want is a metal that comes supposedly from good source of energy, but um, exploits other things that we shouldn't be uh, doing as a producer, as a supply chain. So it's important to bring that holistic view and ASI is one platform where we know that it's third party certified. It's coming to us uh, with that certification that we can give that assurance model through the supply chain. And digital is absolutely going to be critical going forward because uh, none of us could even be in New York for this event. So everything is now moving to a digital platform to, for the ease of use. So thanks to Nick for mentioning that. Absolutely. Well, I certainly hope we can have in-person meetings again at some point. But I actually want to bring JP in here because, um, you know, you're pretty close to the end consumer. And I know we had another question in the chat that I um, haven't gotten to yet, but it's about what about all the other parts of the supply chain? So not just where the aluminum is coming from, but how it's being processed um, and the transportation in between. Um, are your customers asking about that as well? And how difficult or easy is that information to provide? Yeah, no, appreciate it. So uh, I don't know the stat exactly, but in the automotive supply chain from the individual parts to the fully furnished vehicle uh, components uh, are trapped across the border between Canada and the US or the US and Mexico. I think it's something on average over eight times before it's finally assembled. And it's a conversation actively we have with our customer, customer base, especially in automotive. How many processes can we do in-house or close to home so that we reduce the total cost of supplying a product? And as, a, as I mentioned, as a small manufacturer, efficient cost controls are critical to our success, which then becomes our customer's success. And so we are very conscious of um, our unit costs on freight and moving metal um, from our processing plants to our customers' hands. And so it's, uh, I'd say, a minute-by-minute minute, uh, active metric that we build loads to, to be as efficient as possible. And you know, to Paramita's point on now putting some recycling assets into Quebec, that's going to be uh, a great experiment on the role of hydro uh, powered electricity into uh, the recycling. Um, and then part of you know, what you really can art expects um, sort of to what Nick alluded to is that's great for a portion of the supply chain, but there's still going to have to be recycling in other places. And, you know, like microgrid electricity or micro recycling type of activities, how do you make that whole supply chain more efficient so that the shipping unit um, is, is more efficient and ultimately more CO2 um, uh, emissions effective. And you know, I know we had talked about Walmart and Amazon and again, you know, how CanArt supplies, you know, the expectations of the end consumer and the big companies in that regard is to offer solutions that meet the you know, objectives that they need. And often it's an education on how we can make our products more efficient for their total needs, um, as well as um, how, we uh, offer uh, more attractive in investment options. Um, you know, we see rather than say government 
as being the only uh, uh, pusher of these type of standards and uh, investment uh, drivers that, you know, other forms of investment in, you know, the, the pension funds, for example, are going to be driving more and more environmentally, social and governance factor type investing. And, you know, outside of just the hub of, of what Jean spoke about with Quebec, you know, there's going to be a larger push for, for people to be environmentally, socially and, and governments focused in, in the companies that, that, that they invest in and, and that they help fund for growth. And that's where Canada sees ourselves as being as efficient of a manufacturer as possible and carry with that responsible um, governance, environmental and social practices so that um, everything we do is, is both efficient um, and to the, the taste and, and goals of, of say um, a lower CO2 environment. Yeah, those are all great points. Um, and actually, while I've got you, you're allowing me to pivot to the recycling discussion that I know everybody wants to have. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how recycling plays a part in your supply chain? Mm -hmm. So Canart is um, fortunate that our process uh, allows us to um, sell a very, we yield a very high uh, total uh, sellable product to a customer and the balance 100% of our waste is recyclable into reusable feedstock and raw materials. Um, it extends further that within our operations, everything from wood and oil and steel uh, all get uh, disposed of through uh, recycled sources, if, if at all possible. So um, it is a critical cost component of our business that we manage efficiently. And so that is our operational metric to drive efficient recycling and recovery of any uh, waste that we generate throughout our operation. Um, and there aren't many options on the recycling basis now, especially for our aluminum scrap, but there appears to be more options um, you know, coming to the table like the, the announcement that Paramita referenced. That's great. And Nick, you mentioned that there is, there's no way I'd leave you out of a discussion. On recycling, don't worry. Um, but I was curious, you mentioned that we need to do a lot more. On mm -hmm. recycling. And I think when we talk about the circular economy, people have an idealized view of, yeah, someday we'll just be using completely recycled metal. Can you talk a bit to what more needs to be done, but also what the limitations might be? Sure. And uh, yes, I appreciate that. I put my hand up. The, you know, I think for, for, the, for the audience, I think I'd like them to think about aluminium in a certain way. The way I think about it is when a molecule of aluminium is produced in Quebec or China or wherever, that molecule should never be destroyed or wasted. So I, I consider it, you know, when our aluminium is so recyclable, that whatever use that, that molecule has, whether it's in an automotive sheet or an extrusion, it's in a, in a can, in, a, in an airplane, when that application reaches the end of its life, when you scrap your car, when you recycle the can, that molecule should be captured and returned to use in the same form or some other form. And so I think, you know, as we as mentioned, 75% of all the aluminum ever made is still in circulation or in use either in cars or buildings or whatever, all of that should be captured. With a recycling rate of more like 70%, we've got a gap and, uh, today. And I think the mo a big chunk of the gap is in beverage, is in packaging. So if you think of the stuff that gets most fragmented and most least easy to recycle is foil, um, uh, uh, various applications in the household that need to be properly captured. The point is, I think, that we need to partner with even other materials to find a solution to that. I lived in Switzerland for a while and it's is the best recycling system I've ever seen in the world, partly because they tax garbage, right? And that helps people, it motivates people to recycle. And I think in the US, we have in deposit states, very high recycling rates. In states like Georgia, where I am, the recycling rate for beverage counts is less than 30%. There's enormous amount we can do. But again, I think we need to be a little bit better organized overall as an industry. 
and we need where there are big gaps i think we need to be working with not just other aluminum companies but other materials to develop recycling solutions to close the gap in general and you know how recyclable is it the beverage can typically uh, be between taking a can off the cell shelf and replacing it on the shelf it takes about 60 days and in the automotive industry, we have closed loop arrangements with all our customers. So all their manufacturing scrap comes back. And exactly as JP said, it's all fully recyclable. Um, the challenge is at the end of the life of the material, are we getting everything back? And then just to answer the specific question, will we ever be fully self-sufficient on recycled aluminum? Not for a while, because, because of growth, that when we push material out into a building, that's not going to come back for maybe 30, 50, 100 years. So by the time that comes back, there have been another many, many other buildings built. And so recycling has to catch up. Uh, but, but we can be so much better. There's always a role for primary whilst the world is growing. Uh, we need primary units and they should be, you know, the most benignly produced as possible but the emphasis should be on recycling because that's where the real carbon advantage is. Absolutely. I think that was a great summary of, of aluminum and recycling and how everyone in the industry needs to work towards it. Um, so I want to go to a few questions that have been put in through the chat. And I think, Jean, you're probably best to answer this first one, which is about how aluminum companies engage with policymakers and how much of a need there is for private and public partnerships. Ajahn, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah. To the second question to begin with, uh, we have to be very careful in uh, our uh, partnerships with governments in order to respect international trade uh, regulations uh, and, and, and commitments. This being said, uh, most of the, the uh, joint efforts are in research and development uh, in terms of potentially contributing to decarbonizing uh, Canada's production or industrial output. So that's the, 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 the answer to the second question. To the first one, uh, we, the association, represent uh, the global uh, um, upstream, I would say, interests of the primary producers. In other words, before uh, getting into competitive notions. So uh, there's a lot of work that is done through joint committees involving our memberships or representatives of the primary production and government representatives, be it on environmental regulations, on health and safety, or also on sustainability. So it's, it's an ongoing process. It's a very mature approach to policy making, uh, because if you don't work with those who will be, uh, uh, will have to deal with the implementation of the regulation, it's not gonna work the way it should be working. So we've been, we've been undertaking for 20 years almost uh, joint efforts in sustainability improvement of the industry with governments. We made commitments. We went over and beyond the commitments all the time. We delivered the goods. So we have a good working relationship with our government authorities. That's great. I think that's a perfect answer. I'm going to we're almost out of time here, um, so I want to give the last question to Paramita because I know you can have a good answer for this one. It's uh, pointing out that in addition to the CO2 emissions from energy, there are also CO2 produced during electrolysis. And the question is, do you already have implemented a technical solution to avoid the CO2 emissions in Quebec? So Paramita. Right. Julia, just so I get the question right, you're talking about the energy CO2 emissions throughout the process or the electricity part? So during electrolysis, I think it's referring to the direct emission. Oh, okay. okay. So the electrolysis part. Um, before I get into the direct response to that question, Julia, just, just to talk about recycling. Um, you know, I, I love to use this next phrase to my customers and Nick and... Uh, JP have probably heard this from us, but one drop of water 
from our system in Canada gets turned around five times to generate electricity through its time before it gets made into metal. So we're already turning that one drop of water around quite a bit. And as you have seen from both our customers, JP and Nick, their message on recycling was very loud and Rio did step up and uh, you know, respond to that. So very proud of that uh, new direction we've taken. But on electricity, as I mentioned earlier, that 80% of the, the carbon emissions from an aluminum value chain sits with the smelting, the smelting process. And the majority of that actually sits with the electrolysis process itself. Um, and that's why I love to talk about our inert anode project, Lysis, because that's the address. Now, mind you, it took 132 years from a concept to a realization for Lysis to see this share the, the sunshine. So it's going to take time to get it fully implemented at scale. But having said that, what a great adventure it has been to speak about Ulysses. And to your previous question, that's where the government, the industry, the consumers and the customers all stepped up and said, we have a role to play in Ulysses, hence the joint venture. We have uh, you know, several members of the aluminium primary supply chain stepping up. We, have, we had Apple coming together and bringing us all together. And then we had the government of Canada and Quebec coming in. This electrolysis process basically is, when, when you think about the anodes that we make, that's where the maximum carbon emission takes place. And the reason why we say it's inert anode is because it's not going to emit any carbon. Now, I didn't tell you the rest of the story is we are actually seeing that it's not only not emitting carbon, it's going to emit oxygen in the process. So all I'll say is when I say net zero future is, has already started, how great of a future is when we do no longer talk about a low carbon future, but we're talking about a zero carbon positive oxygen future. We can have a metal that has been made emitting oxygen versus emitting carbon. And it gives me personal proud, pride to be speaking as a real to employee that we were able to bring that solution along with our GD partners to the world that that simple electrolysis fix has allowed us to not only reshape the conversation about low carbon. Now, mind you, we can't do it for the whole future. As uh, Nick mentioned, the global supply demand dynamics doesn't allow us to do that. But how great will it be to have metal that is starting with emitting oxygen and then let the supply chain do its magic and then recycling, recycle that pro product back into something which is re reusable. I'm looking forward to the day when somebody will sit in a similar forum and say the last 70 years of Elysis metal is now being used emitting oxygen throughout the process. So really excited for that future to I think that's a fantastic note to end on. A very exciting development for both Quebec and for the aluminum industry. So thank you so much to all of the panelists. This has been such a fascinating discussion and Thank you to everyone who joined us. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you.